So welcome. Um, for those of you who don't know MCC Toronto, and I know some of you may be here for the very first time this evening and being a part of our church, uh, we're a Christian church with uh, about 180 churches in 30 countries around the world. Uh, the church began in the 1960s, 1968, in Los Angeles as a church for gay and lesbian people, and eventually expanding to be bisexual and transgender people uh, as we grew in our awareness. And Troy Perry was the founder, and he started it out of God's call to be a church. And then people visited from lots of other cities and said, we want this in our city and in our country. And so very quickly it went to Miami and Chicago and London, England. And then in 1973, uh, it started here in, in Toronto. And I became the pastor in 1977. And so this August will be my 40th anniversary. And um, I will be stepping down as a senior pastor at the end of this year. Uh, and the congregation is going through a process of electing a new senior pastor. And while our church started with our roots in the gay and lesbian community, um, we um, proudly say today that we are no longer a gay church. Uh, but that we're a Christian church opened and welcoming to all. Um, and although our church currently is overwhelmingly, probably about 80% gay or lesbian um, or transgender, uh, we have more and more trans folks, more and more heterosexual folks, et cetera, coming to our church. And so our church is becoming more and more diverse, and we celebrate that. We're also a church that believes that there is no contradiction between being GLBT and being Christian or being a person of faith. And you're going to hear this this evening as I go through uh, the Bible and the various scriptures that are used uh, or misused um, uh, to condemn gay and lesbian people, um, that we believe that while the Bible condemns some homosexual things, it also condemns some heterosexual things. That while the Bible condemns homosexual rape, it also condemns heterosexual rape. While it condemns some forms of homosexual prostitution, it condemns those same forms of heterosexual prostitution. While it condemns uh, homosexual lust, it condemns heterosexual lust. And so the Bible condemns some homosexual things, um, but the Bible does not anywhere condemn adult, loving, same-sex relationships. That's been our belief from the very beginning. And... Most Christian denominations are struggling with the issue of what to do with the Bible, what to do with these scriptures, does the Bible condemn GLBT people or not? And they're all going through this struggle, and a member of the United Church of Canada set up a commission probably 30 years ago to study homosexuality, and after about four or five months, the commission came back to the head office of the United Church of Canada and said, we need to change our mandate because we realize it's not about studying homosexuality, it's about studying human sexuality. <laughs> that the church doesn't just have a problem with homosexuality, the church has a problem with sexuality and needs to start from that place of studying sexuality in general. And so a lot of the Christian denominations are struggling with this. What's the authority of scripture? What do these Bible verses say? How welcome are gay and lesbian people going to be in our church? So we're not just you know, we were leading, I think, uh, the, the struggle with this and the awareness of this, but most Christian denominations are struggling with this. And so you have the United Church of Canada that's now and come out and said, GLB, GLBT people are welcome, we ordain GLBT clergy, we do GLBT weddings. You have the Anglican Church of Canada uh, that's divided on the issue and struggling on the issue, uh, but have just more recently said that they will uh, ordain uh, and welcome, or, ordain openly uh, GLBT folks, and uh, the issue of the same with gay marriage. Um, and so, and there are other churches that are more conservative but are still struggling with the issue. And things are changing. In fact, the latest statistics tell us that young evangelicals no longer care about abortion or homosexuality. They care about poverty and the environment. Right? And so there's a big shift uh, that's going on uh, in society. So it's a struggle, it's a challenge, it's an issue that lots of folks are looking at right now, and uh, that's exciting. And uh, sorry. tell a little bit about myself. Uh, I uh, was raised a strict fundamentalist Baptist, 
my mother was Roman Catholic, my father was Pentecostal, and they thought the compromise was Baptist. And so when a neighbor saw me as a three-year-old recruit, uh, she said to my parents, can I start taking Brent to church? And they said, absolutely. And so I was raised a very strict fundamentalist Baptist um, and grew up, I, I've known that I was gay from as far back as I can remember. Uh, Tarzan and I used to sit on the, swing on the vines and sit in the tree house together, uh, watching the sunset every night. And there was no Jane in the picture, just me and Tarzan. Um, and uh, I've known that I, I didn't have the language to describe it. There was no one on TV who was openly gay that I knew about, but I just knew that I was different, and I just knew that the way people talked about boys and girls, I thought about boys and boys, but I didn't have the language. And I felt called to Christian ministry uh, in uh, junior high school, but by the time I had to graduate from high school to make a decision which university to go to, I felt like I was abandoning my best friend. I felt like I was saying no to God that I couldn't go to Acadia and become a Baptist minister. And that was a very difficult decision. So instead I went to Mount Allison University to, frankly, get a science degree to prove evolution wrong and um, discovered that that's how God did it. And wasn't it amazing how God created the world? And eventually became a high school teacher and found out about it, MCC through a uh, gay magazine and moved here in 1976 and became the pastor of the church in 1977. Uh, so that's a little bit about, about my history. So, before we begin to look at specific scriptures and ways of approaching scripture, there's kind of like two ways to approach scripture. The more evangelical churches tend to approach scripture more literally, as literal fact, literal truth. Although, as some scholars says, there's no such thing as a literalist. There's only selective literalists. That no one takes the whole Bible literally, if they're being honest. They pick and choose which things they want to take literally. Or you can approach the Bible metaphorically and say whether something is true or not is not really the relevant issue. The issue is, what does it say to us today? What meaning can we take from it today? So you have those two kind of extremes, a literalist approach to scripture and a metaphorical approach to scripture. I'm somewhere surprisingly in the middle. There are some things in, Bible, in the Bible that I believe are or could be literally true. There are other things in the Bible that I think absolutely no way that could have happened. Two examples. I don't believe that Noah and the ark ever happened. Impossible. And even there's, dis there's disagreements in the Bible whether it was two pairs of animals or seven pairs of animals, uh, whether God closed the door of the ark or Noah closed the door of the ark, etc. Those are contradictions within the Bible. But the thought of being able to take two or seven pairs of every animal that existed on earth, put them all in one ark, and they floated around for 40 days. What did they do with all the poop? You know, it just makes no sense to me that this could have happened. And why Noah didn't just solve that mosquito issue, you know, with one swat, you know, it just does, doesn't seem to me that's likely to be something that happened literally. But that doesn't shake my faith at all. So someday they find the ark, great. If someday they prove that it never happened, so what? You know? Um, and the other example I use frequently is when the people of Israel escaped uh, out of slavery in Egypt and were led eventually to the promised land and got on the edge of the promised land. The Bible says that God told them to go in and to murder every man, woman, and child and take possession of the land. I don't believe that God ever said that. I don't believe that's literal at all. That a God of unconditional love would say to one people, massacre everybody and take possession of the land. So some things in the Bible, I think, yes, we can take literally. Other things in the Bible, I think, are, are not meant to be taken literally. And so you have the extremes, and then there are some of us in between who believe some things happened and believe other things uh, didn't happen. And I believe that the Bible is best looked at as the, the history of the early people of church, of the early people of faith, and how they wrestled with 
some of the big questions we wrestle with. So what did the early people of faith think about, is there a God? Why are we here? Is there life after death? And I think the Bible is a great, great book that gives us the record of our faith ancestors. And it's very important to see what they did and how they learned and how they grew and where they got it right and where they got it wrong. The Bible is also very good because it's the only record we have of the life of Jesus and his teachings. There are no other records uh, than what's in the Bible. Now, there have been some other lost gospels that have been found, fragments and pieces, but in general, if we want to learn about the life and teachings of Jesus, the only place we have to go uh, is uh, the Bible. And the Bible is great because it's the, also the record of the early Christian church and how they responded to Jesus' life and how they responded to his teachings. And so we have this great, great record. And so I take the Bible very, very seriously, but I do not take the Bible literally. I, I, I believe that the Bible is a wonderful gift and a great record that we have. We can learn so much from it. But I don't believe that I would go to the Bible to look for instructions of how to drive a car or how to operate a microwave or how to f- turn on Facebook or even how to deal with some of the complex issues that we face as people today. And Jesus said, I will leave you the Holy Spirit. I will leave you the Comforter to teach you all things. So we shouldn't teach, you know, we shouldn't treat the Bible like it's a paper pope, right? We shouldn't treat the Bible as this is where we go to find the answer to everything. Jesus said, I will leave you the Holy Spirit. That's a tougher way to try to figure things out. But that's the way that Jesus indicated to us that we are to try to seek truth through the Holy Spirit and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. I also think it's important for people to really understand where the Bible came from. I was just reading a quote from someone, and they said, a fifth grade understanding of the Bible is dangerous. Right? When we don't quite understand where it came from and, and what it's about, then we can so easily misuse it and misinterpret it. And if you think about it, there were lots and lots of books. The Bible is, the Protestant Bible is 66 books, written by many, many different people over thousands of years. And there were lots of other books around as well, besides these 66 books. And there came a time when the emperor decided that he wanted, the Roman emperor decided that he wanted to consolidate the empire into one empire with one religion to unify it. And he liked Christianity, so he chose Christianity as the religion. And he wanted one set of sacred books One structure, one head. And so he called a meeting of bishops and politicians, pulled them together and said, okay, you figure this out, but before you leave, I want one religion with one structure, one head, and one set of books. And they argued and debated and voted, literally voted about which books were going to get in the Bible. Some were easy for them to put in, some were a difficult discussion, some barely made it in, like the Gospel of John, The Gospel of Thomas barely got defeated and didn't get in, and they are very different books. The Gospel of John talks about the children of Israel being the children of the devil. Horrendous. The Jews are the children of the devil. Horrendous. It's in the Gospel of John, and it's good in the Bible. The Gospel of Thomas, uh, it talks about um, Jesus saying that uh, it's not about him, it's about God. Uh, It's about God among us, God within us, as opposed to God way outside us. And it didn't get in. And so, literally, think about it, I think some of us think the Bible sort of dropped from heaven as a compact book already put together, right, And, and we got the Bible. No, it was a whole bunch of books among a whole bunch of other books. And they had to decide which are going to be the sacred books. And in fact, we even have the Bible used mostly by Roman Catholics that has the Apocrypha in it, which is another set of books in between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Right? And so we can't even agree on what is the Bible, which books are in the Bible. Um, also, you know, we can argue forever, 
Did something happen or didn't it happen? But really, what difference does it make whether there was a Noah in the ark or not? Or whether Esther was ever a queen or not? Or even whether the people of Israel escape from Egypt and go back to the promised land. You know, archaeologists say there's absolutely no proof that that ever happened. And if that did happen, and there were hundreds of thousands of people who migrated and moved, that there would be some evidence that that happened. And my point is, you know, it's fun to have these discussions. Did it happen? Did it not happen? But I'd much rather talk about what's the meaning for us today? What's the story for, what, what does it say to us today? And I'll just give you an example of, of where I think when people take the Bible literally, it, uh, it turns people off faith. Because when people read the Bible, they say, oh my God, God said that? Oh my God, these people are condemned? Right? Like, is this really the Bible? But when people look at the Bible metaphorically, I think it brings it alive because I think it makes the Bible what it was really meant to be. A story that tells us some truths and helps us in our own journey. So I'll give you an example. Jesus walking on water. The story is told that, uh, that Jesus was, they sent the disciples out in the boat and, and it was a storm and the disciples were afraid and so that Jesus walked across on water to them. And they thought it was a ghost at first. And then when they realized it was Jesus, Peter said, if it's really you, Jesus, you know, tell me to come out of the boat and walk on water. And Jesus said, come on. So Peter got out of the boat and started walking on water. And he got afraid when the wind blew against his ear. And he started to sink. And he reached out and Jesus pulled him up. Now, did that happen or not? I don't know. Could it have happened? Yeah. I think Jesus could have done that. However, if you take it literally, that Jesus walked on water, all you're left with is, wasn't Jesus great? Look at what he did. But if you take it metaphorically, it says that all of us are to get out of the boat. All of us are to get out of the safe places and take chances. All of us are to trust God enough that when we take risks, we'll be okay. And when we get afraid and start to sink, we can reach out for help. And when we do, miracles happen. I mean, look at that. That, make, that brings the Bible alive for us. That challenges all of us to be more than we've been. And so I think, you know, for me, the concept of dealing with the Bible metaphorically is very exciting because it brings it alive. Now, that was all meant to be an introduction to my class tonight and to get you thinking. And so what I want to do is I want to take just a few minutes and I want to ask you to move around a little bit Find somebody that you're one or two people you didn't come with. And I'd like at least maybe say in groups of three. And I would like you to talk about why are you here and what are some of the key questions you hope get addressed tonight. Okay? So we're going to take ten minutes, groups of three. Why are you here? And what are the questions you hope get addressed tonight? Go for it.
Okay, if we could come back together a little bit. Um, and if I could ask if there are some folks who would volunteer to name one or two of the questions that people hope to be answered this evening that came up in your group, um, that that would be helpful. So does anyone have, want to share a question or two from your group that came up that people would like to see answered this evening? Great. Wonderful question. How do you share the, the good news of the gospel uh, with the LGBT community, especially when the way the Bible has been misused, either literally or metaphorically, uh, in a negative way? At the end of my lecture, I'm going to talk about some good news and where we go from here, and that's a great question. The Bible is often uh, used to attack, and so how do you respond to those attacks, and how do you defend, defend your faith, and how do you defend the concept that you can be LGBT and be Christian, LGBT and a person of faith? Great. We'll, we'll absolutely go there. Other questions? Okay, here we go. Uh, so I think it's important for us to do this work. Uh, and this is where I'm starting to use some of the notes in your, in your handout. Because part of being a person of faith, I think, is to be constantly searching for more wisdom and more truth. Not to be stuck where we are, but how can we learn, how can we grow? And in John chapter 8, verse 2, it says, You shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So part of our job is to search for wisdom, to search for truth, to be open to new understandings. You know, if you said a hundred years ago, in the southern U.S. to a young black male, a young white male, if you said, the Bible says it's okay to have slaves, that person would likely have said, of course the Bible says that. Right? It was just taken as a given. Right? Uh, the church was the main supporter of apartheid in South Africa. It was just taken as a given because the Bible says, slave, obey your master. Now they ignored the section that says there is neither slave nor free. We're all one, right? Um, and so, you know, it, 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 to, try to, to, to try to look at scriptures not in isolation but in the full context and to try to find more wisdom and more truth and to be very careful not to take one verse uh, out of isolation. I mean, look at, the, look at Paul, for instance. In Paul's writings, in his earlier writings, he said women were to keep silent in church. But later on, as he matured, he appointed a woman as the head of a church. So if you just take his earlier writings in the Bible and take a verse out of context, as many churches have done that have not had women clergy, and some churches still do in terms of not having women priests, they've taken an isolated scripture out of context and ignored the scripture that says, there is neither male nor female. We're all one in Christ Jesus. Right? And how could churches ever condemn trans people when the Bible says there is neither male nor female. We're all one. We're all one together. Secondly, it's important to do this study because we can become so enslaved by other people's prejudices and just take things for truth, especially when they look holy, right, or when they're clergy or when they say the Bible says. Right? It almost, it's, it's, it's almost uncanny how often someone will say the Bible says and that ends the discussion instead of opening the discussion, right, and beginning a conversation. And so we need to be very, very careful when we give too much power to religious authorities and too much power to traditional religion and we can become enslaved to their prejudices. And thirdly, we need to do this study because of the condemnation from other people. 
uh, and even sometimes that condemnation within ourselves. And Romans 8, 1 says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And so not being enslaved by other people's prejudices and not condemning ourselves unjustly. And the Bible has been so misused. It's so tragic that the Bible has been so misused down through history. Almost everybody in any argument can find a verse in the Bible to support their argument or oppose their argument. And, you know, there's Bible verses that seem to endorse incest. Right? There's Bible verses that say uh, women who wear red, excuse me, are condemned. Right? There are Bible verses that, says, that said that if you have a child who's consistently delinquent, you're to take them to the edge of the field and they're to be stoned to death by the elders of the, church, of the, of the community. That women who commit adultery are to be stoned, not men, but women who commit adultery are to be stoned. There's horrendous Bible verses. Right? There's a Bible verse that says all eating all shellfish is to be condemned. And I've never seen a fundamentalist church picketing a seafood restaurant. <laughs> right? But there's a Bible verse there. Right? There's, there's a Bible verse that says, okay, I'm going to quote the Bible. Don't be mad at me when you hear this. This is in the Bible. Anyone with any physical deformity is not allowed into the temple. So if we were going to go strictly by the Bible, we would take, a, take out our wheelchair ramp. Right? But that's in the Bible. Churches don't believe that stuff. Lots of fundamentalist churches have wheelchair ramps and accessible elevators and accessible washrooms and, and, and stuff, right? Uh, and so the Bible has been so, uh, so misused to condemn other faiths, uh, to, be, to use as a, as a justification for war, um, etc., and to condemn whole sections of society. So it's important for us to have a mature understanding of the Bible, and particularly as it relates to homosexuality and human sexuality. So there's a little bit of a brief bibliography there. Dean, are these your books? Oh, from our book nook. So there's lots more books up here uh, that deal with the subject beyond the ones that I just listed here. But I just wanted to highlight some for, for you. One of my favorites is The New Testament and Homosexuality by Robin Scroggs. Um, he started out when they had a debate in his church about homosexuality, and he was appalled at the way people were just using scripture, although he didn't know much about the issue, and he decided he needed to study it. And he studied the issue and wrote a book. And in the end, he said he does not believe that the Bible condemns any adult-loving homosexual relations. Christianity, Social Tolerance, and Homosexuality by John Boswell, a professor at Yale, a much more academic, heavier book to get through. Uh, but he talks about the early history of the Christian church and where gay and lesbian people were welcomed in the early church. And there are uh, evidence, when he was doing his research for his second book on gay marriage, he went to the Vatican to try to get access to the Vatican Library, uh, wasn't having much success. Uh, and then he tells a story of one day he was walking on, on the quadrangle um, in, the, in the Vatican and this priest with a long uh, black cassock walked towards him and he thought oh this piece is looking pretty angry and just as the priest got up to him he slipped him a piece of paper and the paper said you'll find what you're looking for in this section of the Vatican library and he went there and there was evidence of the church doing early gay marriages right and so his, his, his next book was about uh, gay marriage in the church uh, and stuff, and so his he talks about early acceptance. But basically, what basically Boswell says is very interesting. He says for about the first thousand years, the church was accepting of gay and lesbian people, and then about around the thousand year mark, society in general began to develop this very dualistic thinking. Everything was being divided into good and bad, and so things like intellect was good and emotions were bad. Men were good and women were bad because they were seen as more emotional, right? And sex became bad. And when sex became bad and only for procreation, guess what that did to gay sex? It made it always bad because it wasn't for procreation. And so when that became part of society, then that also became part of the church, and around that turn, the church became less and less accepting of gay and lesbian people and more and more negative towards gay and lesbian people. So we've gone through almost a thousand years of positive and then now a thousand years of negative. And, and Scroggs talks, uh, Boswell talks about that a lot in his book. 
The next one, Is the Homosexual My Neighbor? Uh, by Letha Scanzoni and Virginia Mollencott. Um, and it's a good book for people who come from more evangelical traditions. Very helpful. Uh, the Church and the Homosexual uh, by Father John McNeil, uh, a Jesuit priest uh, who recently passed away, a great um, supporter of MCC, attended our church in Fort Lauderdale regularly. We had him here uh, years ago to, to speak uh, at our church, a wonderful man, and he uh, was a Jesuit who was silenced by the Vatican for his support for gay and people. Uh, he wrote another book called Taking a Chance on God which was reaching out to gay and lesbian people, inviting them back into the church again, or uh, into, into faith community. I include the next one in to be a little bit controversial. Uh, Jonathan Love David, a uh, book by Tom Horner, and he makes the case that John, uh, I think pretty convincingly, that Jonathan and David was a gay love story uh, in scripture. Uh, and, um, and I'll talk about it a little bit more, uh, a little later on. And I happened to be in Israel um, in... I think 1999, or it could have been 2001, I forget. And it was in Israel, and they were having a big debate in the Knesset about gay rights. And one of the members of the Knesset, which is the Israeli parliament, said, how can you condemn gay people? Our ancestor uh, David was gay. And it caused almost a near riot uh, in the Knesset between the, the conservatives and the orthodox who were furious that this person said that um, and, and stuff. But uh, anyway, I'll come back to that. So, I want to mention a tool that I'm going to be referring to uh, a little later on. And if you have a Bible with you tonight, I would have, and if I'd encouraged everyone to bring their Bible, I would have asked you to open up the front cover and tell me which Bible you have. And some people would say, what do you mean, which Bible I have? Well, which version do you have? Because if you look on the inside cover, you'll see King James Version, Revised Standard Version, New American version, okay? We have no one version of the Bible. We have many different versions of the Bible. Some of them differ from each other dramatically in some places, and some have minor differences, right? And so someone got this great idea of putting together a parallel Bible, and this one has four different translations side by side. So you can see what the King James Version, the Modern Language Bible, the Living Bible, and the Revised Standard Version, how they all translate the same verse. And you're going to find a lot of similarity, but occasionally some differences. So this is called a parallel Bible. And then I have this one that's only the New Testament, but it has eight translations. The King James, the Phillips, the Revised Standard, the Jerusalem, the Living Bible, the New International Version, today's English Version, and the New English Bible. Eight side by side, but just the New Testament. And it's really interesting if you want to know, what does John 2.16 or 3.16 or 4.16 say? Then you could easily open up and you can see how four different translations translate that verse. And again, lots of it will be very, very similar, but occasionally you'll see some pretty uh, dramatic differences. So, now that we're going to start our lecture today, um, there are five parts that I want to go over. I want to talk about the importance of the study. I want to talk about the background, the main scriptures, the big eight that people usually use to attack us, some new words of encouragement, and then a final uh, summary. So... Why is this important? First, self-acceptance and peace through truth. For those of us who are gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender, especially if we were raised in conservative religious traditions, we have to come to peace with this issue. We, have, we can't take the Bible and cut out holes and ignore things. Right? We've got to address this. And when I first arrived in Toronto, that was what kept me busy my first year here, is... All of a sudden, I had these resources and books to read and things to think about, and I just had to settle the issue. Does the Bible condemn me or not? So self-acceptance, um, very, very important. Um, I would say this is also true, uh, not just for gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender people, but I would say this is also true for people of color. How do you deal with a Bible that says, slave, obey your master? Right? Uh, and how are you going to love the book? Well, it has these things in it. Or if you're a woman, 
How are you going to deal with this book that you love? Well, it's being used to say you can't be a priest or you can't have full equality in the church or you're less than, right? And so I think for lots of us, it's important for us to, to, to be more accepting of ourselves through study and, and, and for truth. Secondly, whether you're gay or lesbian, bisexual or transgender or not, I think the work we're doing tonight is important so that you can help other people. So when other people say to you, well, doesn't the Bible condemn me? That, that you can help and you can say, you know, well, let's take a look at what the Bible is and let's take a look at those verses together, right? Um, my guess is, Kevin, this will be up on Facebook and people can see it in the future and refer other people to it and stuff and that's one of the ways to, to say, hey, take a look at this thing on Facebook and then let's talk. And thirdly, to defend your faith. Now, defending your faith when you're attacked is more about yourself feeling okay than it is about changing someone else's mind because you're not likely to change their opinion right when people are so solid in a in a pretend literalistic interpretation of scripture and if there's a scripture that seems to be so clear then you're unlikely to change their mind uh, but who knows miracles happen and so I want to talk about the Bible being the inspired word of God and, and, and the first little section I want to talk about is just some general biblical approaches. There are two different schools of thought around the Bible being the inspired word of God. And it's because of the, these two different schools of thought that you get major conflict in some, some denominations. And one school of thought is that the people who wrote the Bible had free will and they wrote things down as they saw them as they remember them, as they believed things. And we could leave here tonight and I could ask all of you to write my lecture out and you're going to see widely different accounts of what I said and how I said it tonight. Right? The same thing is true uh, in the Bible. So this school of thought says authors had free will, they wrote things down as they understood it, you know, some people believe that none of the four Gospels were written until 90 years after Jesus' death. And that there were bits and pieces of his, his, of his teachings around here and there, etc. And that some time later, four different people tried to put together an account of Jesus' life. Right? 90 years later? Nine minutes later would be a challenge. You know, the police say that, that you know, eyewitness accounts of an accident are the least reliable thing in terms of trying to determine what happened. And so, you know, people actually remembering uh, things. But the second way of viewing the Bible as the inspired word of God is that people, that the authors were basically stenographers that God dictated and people wrote down exactly what God told them, right? And so, did human error come into it with free will or was it dictated by God? And you see, different arguments because of the, the approach that people take. But the reality is, um, you know, I, I would say that a reasonable portion of the sermons that Dina and I write together are inspired by God. I would say there are times when these ideas come, Dina's saying, well, maybe, not a, maybe a smaller portion. Maybe when she's not there, it's a higher portion. Maybe when she's there, it's a lower. I don't know. But anyway. Um, but I would say that a reasonable portion of the ideas that we get for sermons, we think are inspired, that they come from God. But certainly there are times when it's her perspective or my perspective that gets in the sermons as well. So we don't claim that every single word of every single sermon is true. Um, now, even those folks who believe in the Bible being dictated by God, including Calvin, would say that while the Bible was originally dictated by God, the fact that it's been translated and, and transcribed and handed down through the centuries, that some errors have gotten into the Bible. And that there are mis human mistakes, that God may have dictated it in the beginning, but the translations down through the centuries have caused some mistakes. Um, Augustine was worried about confusing 
figurative language and literal language. He says some language in scripture is meant to be taken literally, while other language in scripture is meant to be more figurative. And Calvin said that even as conservative and as rigid as Calvin was, he said that there were minor errors that existed in even the version that he thought was the most accurate. So, secondly, original meaning. What did the authors mean back then when they wrote something? You know, when Paul said women are keep silent in church, what did he mean? Why was he doing that? Some people said it was because in, in, the, in the Jewish synagogue, women weren't allowed to sit in the main floor, that women had to sit in the balcony, right? And men were allowed to sit in the main floor and that people were encouraged to discuss things and talk about things, etc. And that he felt that, uh, that the people in the balcony were not paying much attention. And he said, women keep silent. Did that mean all women keep silent forever? That's crazy, right? So what, what was meant back then? Um, and also, was something condemned then for a reason or for all time? For instance, I'm from the Maritimes, and I know that you can't dig oysters, or clams, sorry, you can't dig clams at certain times of the year because they're poisonous, right? And so you have to let them mature, and there's only certain times of the year that you can dig clams. And so, if they're condemning shellfish, was that because people were digging shellfish all, all during the year and people were dying of it? And so they said, look, we've got to stop this eating shellfish. It's not a spiritual thing. It's not that it's wrong to eat shellfish. It's, they were just trying to keep people from being poisoned. And they said the same thing. I keep pointing you out, sorry. Uh, they keep saying the same thing about women wearing red. That there was, what they think happened was that there was uh, some cancer-causing uh, chemicals in the dye that was used for red clothing. And it just seemed that more women who were wearing red were dying. And so they said women shouldn't wear red. Right? So when something is condemned in Scripture, what was it really about? What, is it just something that is very isolated for that situation or for all time? Thirdly, the changing language. Um, and... You know, I wish there was a Bible verse that says, go forth and be gay. <laughs> right? I wish it was there, right? Because you could imagine how quick the literalists would no longer be literalists, right? Because gay used to mean happy, colorful, right? And go forth and be happy and colorful. I wish there was a verse that said, go forth and be gay, right? Um, but there isn't. But language changes, and the meaning of language changes. Um, and um, and I'll, I'll talk about particularly about that in, in a little later on. And the third, uh, the next area I want to talk about textual criticism. And that's where scholars try to reconstruct as, merely, as, as much as they can the original text written by the author. Now, we have to remember, we have no signed copies of any of the books of the Bible. We have no original copies of any of the books of the Bible. All we have left is what was translated from translations and, and transcribed down through the centuries. And so, and many different versions and some disagreement, but to try to get back as much as we can to what the authors originally wrote. And in the parallel Bibles, the two versions that I want to hold up for you are the King James Version and the Revised Standard Version. And those are two of the main schools of thought. The King James Version is predominantly used by fundamentalist churches. I grew up in a Baptist church, and that was the only Bible that I ever heard of, was the King James Version. And the Revised Standard Version is traditionally used in more mainline Protestant churches. And the King James Version was translated into English in 1611 by King James. He wanted an English translation. He happened to have been a gay king, which I think is kind of ironic. But anyway, and it was translated from a manuscript called Textus Receptus. It was an ancient manuscript that they had, and it was translated into English. Twenty years later, another manuscript was given to the British by the Turkish um, emperor, and it was called Codus Alexandrius. And it, when they examined it, they found that it was an older version than the King James, and it was a more reliable Greek text than the King James. And so it was translated into English. 
Now, again, most of it is similar, not a lot of difference, which is pretty miraculous when you think it's been handed down now for centuries and centuries and centuries of, of trans, uh, transcribing and translation. But there are some differences, and I'll give you an example. In 1 John chapter 4.19, the King James says this, and really listen to the two different translations. We love him, meaning God, because he first loved us. The Revised Standard Version translates it differently. We love because God first loved us. See the little difference? One says we love God because God loves us. And the other says we love because God loved us. Not a big difference, but a difference. And part of what the brilliance of the Revised Standard Version is, every 50, 70, 500 years, they call together a group of scholars to take a look at the latest version of the Revised Standard Version and take a look at the latest scholarship and to see if we can improve it. Not make it politically correct, but make it more accurate. Whereas the King James was frozen in time in 1611 before we had computers, before we found the Rosetta Stone, the Dead Sea Scrolls, all kinds of other discoveries that help us, help us to be more accurate in translating Scripture. King James, Frozen in Time, Revised Standard Version, New Revised Standard Version, etc., continually updated. Another difference in John chapter 5, verses 3 and 4. In the King James Version, it says, Jesus came to the pool at Bethsaida. There was a great multitude of impotent folk, blind, halt, withered, waiting for the moving of the waters for an angel to stir up the water, and the first one who got into the water was healed. Okay, that's the King James. The Revised Standard Version says that Jesus came to the pool of Bethsaida. There was a great multitude of people there, various disabilities, waiting for an angel. It didn't say that they were waiting for the moving of the water. They didn't know why, the, the people were waiting there. And they believe that someone added into the King James later that they were waiting for the waters to be stirred up because they wanted some explanation about why all these people were there. And so someone added in an explanation based on some rumor or myth or something, but that it was never there in the first place. And again, I don't say these things to shake your, your faith in the scripture, but to point out to you, there are differences in different translations. Also, there's a difference between a translation and a paraphrase. A translation tries to go back to the original writing, the original meaning as much as possible. A paraphrase generally takes a translation and tries to put it in modern English. So you have Bibles that have been translated for teenagers, where it's a paraphrase. It's put into language that teenagers can understand. Right? And so there's nothing dishonest about a paraphrase, but you need to know what it is. It's not a translation. It's not meant to be as accurate. It's meant to be easier to read. And I'll give you some, some differences between a paraphrase, a translation and a paraphrase. First Samuel twenty forty one. Uh, let me just find my notes. First Samuel twenty forty one. I'm gonna read it. So the King James says this. Okay. This is the story of Jonathan and David. And if you look in the Bible, it says that, that Jonathan and David um, hung out together a lot. And Saul, Jonathan's father, was upset. And he said, you're an embarrassment. You're a shame to your mother. We're not going to let you hang out together anymore. And banned them from seeing each other. And Jonathan really missed David, so he sent a message to David to meet him somewhere. And Jonathan escaped from the house, went to meet David, and they ran to each other, and, and then I'll read what they said. Okay? King James, as soon as the lad was gone, David arose out of a place, meaning as soon as his servant was gone, David arose out of a place towards the south and fell on his face to the ground and bowed himself three times, and they kissed one another, Jonathan and David, 
and wept with one another until David exceeded. Meant he had an orgasm. That's what the word means, exceeded. He had an orgasm. Okay, so they kissed each other and David had an orgasm. Now, the Living Bible, which is a paraphrase, as soon as the lad was gone, David came from where he had been hiding near the south edge of the field and they sadly shook hands. <laughs> they didn't kiss each other. They shook hands. Tears running down their cheeks until David could weep no more. Until he finished crying instead of having an orgasm. Now, is the Living Bible dishonest? No, it's a paraphrase. And if it's putting it in modern language, except for Church and Wellesley, men don't kiss each other when they greet each other. They greet each other by shaking hands, apparently. And they don't have orgasms together. Right? So it put it into modern language that made sense to more conservative folks. Right? But the difference between um, a paraphrase and a um, translation. And one more example. In Romans chapter 16, verse 16... Romans 16, 16. The King James. Salute one another with a holy kiss. And that's where you get the kiss of peace. Right? The Living Bible says. Shake hands warmly with each other. Right? Just a little difference. So we do the extended hand of friendship. You know, we follow the, the other Bible. Okay. So the next thing is historical criticism, and that's where they try to take a look at, in the light of contemporary movements today, have we learned anything about history? And an example there is the PIM. And in 1 Samuel 13, 21, it says, they had a PIM to sharpen the files and the tools. And they couldn't figure out what a PIM was. So when the King James was translated, it was translated into a file. They thought it meant that, that they had a file to sharpen the tools. But later on, they found a document called the PIM. And what it was, was how much you charge for sharpening the tools. So there was a fee for sharpening the tools. So the King James was incorrect when it used the word file. Because we found more modern documents that explain uh, what that word meant. And so we have huge advantages today in translating scripture. Because of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Rosetta Stone, the and computers, etc., we are more able today to translate those ancient manuscripts into correct English than they did in 1611 when it was translated into English, the King James. Source criticism is an attempt to take a look at where the authors got their information. And uh, there was a, some beliefs that there, were, that there were different source documents that the authors who wrote the books of the Bible were drawing from. And so that's why in some stories of the flood, for instance, one section of the, of the same Bible, King James, in one place it'll say that there were two pairs of animals. In another place it says five pairs of clean and seven pairs of unclean. In one place it says it was 40 days and 40 nights. In another, day, another place it says it was a different number of days and nights that it rained. In one place it says that God closed the door of the ark before the rain. In another place it says Noah closed the door of the ark before the rain. So even within the King James, there's contradictions. So, again, I don't say this to shake your confidence in the Bible, but I want you to not to have a fifth grade attitude towards the Bible, but a more adult attitude towards what we're dealing with. So now I want to take a look at the eight scriptures that have been historically used to condemn homosexuality. But before I do that, what was homosexuality back then? If I asked you what homosexuality is today, you'd say where two people of the same sex are attracted to each other and love each other, etc. What was homosexuality back What were they condemning back then? And, uh, and is it the same as today? Um, for instance... Gives you another example. Jesus clearly condemned divorce. No question. Jesus clearly condemned divorce. But what was he condemning? 
He was condemning a practice where if a man wanted to divorce his wife, all he had to say was, I divorce you, I divorce you, I divorce you. All he had to do was say it three times and she was gone. And her, generally, her options then were poverty or prostitution because no one else would marry her. So he was condemning this practice of men being able to discard wives, take new wives, and condemning them to poverty or prostitution. I think we would all condemn that practice. But was, was Jesus condemning what we have today where we have laws, not the greatest, but some laws protecting women when there's a divorce situation? Would Jesus say that two people have to stay together no matter how much they no longer get along? No. So, in the same light, what was homosexuality back then? Most people back then didn't believe that homosexuality was a state of being. They saw it as an act. That people committed homosexual acts uh, for different reasons. And, um, and so, you, you even have, uh, when in New Testament times, in Roman literature... Male to male sexuality being referred to as pederasty, okay, or pedophilia. Um, and in Corinthians and Roman times, um, pedophilia was seen more as the result of homosexual acts than someone being a homosexual themselves. And Plato, if you look at Plato's writings and the debates about pederasty in Plato, or homosexuality in Plato. Um, Plato said that, um, that it's okay, the, rape, the phrase platonic love, that it's okay for, for an older man to love a younger boy, but you shouldn't have sex with them. It's to be platonic love. Right? And so that the act of sex was wrong. Um, and Robin Scroggs in his book says, we now know that the male homosexuality that Paul knew about, the apostle Paul knew about, and that he opposed, had to have been one or more form of pedophilia. That's what he was condemning. So, I want to take a look at Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy uh, chapter 23, verses... Let me just get Deuteronomy, chapter 23. Okay. And verse 17 and 18. And there are four more scriptures that are related that cover exactly the same thing all together. Uh, and I want to compare the King James to the Revised Standard. And here's what the King James Version says. There shall be no whore of the daughters of Israel, nor a sodomite of the sons of Israel in the temple. Thou shalt not bring the hire of a whore or the price of a dog into the house of God. For even both of these are an abomination unto God. So, whore of the daughters, sodomite of the sons. So when you think of that, whore of the daughters of Israel, what do you think of? Prostitution. When you think sodomite of the sons, what do you think? Gay people or homosexuals. Some people might say gay prostitutes, and if you did, you're closer to the, to the truth. Now, the Revised Standard, translated more recently with more knowledge and information, says this. There shall be no cult prostitute of the daughters of Israel, neither shall there be a cult prostitute of the sons of Israel in the temple. Right? Nothing to do with homosexuality, to do with prostitution. Because there used to be a belief that if you wanted to have a big crop or a big family and you wanted to have lots of, of wealth, that you would go to the temple and that you would have sex with the temple prostitutes. And if you had sex with the temple prostitutes and paid them a lot of money, then you would have a big family and a big crop. Right? I think if you had sex with your wife, you'd be more likely to have a big family. But anyway, um, but they believe that temple prostitution. What this is saying is you don't have to go through temple prostitutes to relate to God. Right? But when it was translated into English, in the King James Version, it was whore of the daughters, sodomite of the sons. And therefore was used to, get, to condemn gay people when uh, scholars say what was originally meant there 
was prostitution in all of its forms. Bad translation. Second one I want to look at is Genesis and the related one in Judges. And the story here is uh, the story of the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And if I asked you to tell me why Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed, most of you would probably say because of homosexuality. And it's related to the word Sodom or sodomy and homosexuality. But if you look in the Bible, there are a number of places where it's talked about why was Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed. And it's very clear. Inhospitality to strangers, not taking care of the widows, not taking care of the orphans, and immoral behavior, one of the things listed. Right? Jesus said the sin of, of Sodom was inhospitality to strangers. Jesus said that. Right? Not about homosexuality. And if you read the chapters before the city was, city was destroyed, it said that God had already decided to destroy the city. Now, we may argue with that, whether God decides to destroy whole cities or not. But that God had already decided to destroy the cities before the angels were sent. And so the angels were sent to destroy the city. And so what happened was, Lot and Abraham decided to divide up the land. And, and Abraham, being a generous person, uh, Abraham, being a generous person, decided to let Lot have the valley where it was rich and fertile ground. And so Lot moved into Sodom. He was a stranger to Sodom, a different religion than people in Sodom. Right? And part of Lot's religion taught him hospitality to strangers is crucial. If you were Jewish in those days and a stranger came to your house, you were obliged to give them three days free lodging and food. Really strong belief in hospitality to strangers. We see this down today. The Jewish community is probably the most generous community in terms of giving to charitable causes and caring for people in need of any community around. Right? Because they've been taught this hospitality to strangers from, from ancient times. And so the angels arrive at, in, the city, in, the, in, in the city at nighttime. And so they camped outside the city. Because if they tried to come into the city at nighttime, people think they were spies. So they waited. Lot heard that they were there. He went out to them at night. He said, come and stay at my place. So here's, here's this new person, a stranger himself, Lot, inviting these other strangers into his house at night. So it looked like he was bringing spies into the city. And so it's, the Bible says that all of the men of Sodom, not 10%, but all of the men of Sodom went to Lot's house in a riotous mood and they demanded that he bring out the angels that, that they may know them. Y-A-D-H-A. That they may know them. That word is used 943 times in the Old Testament. 933 times it means, hi, I want to get to know you. So it could have meant that they want bring them out that we may question them. To find out what's going on here. Only 10 times is it used with a sexual connotation. Adam knew Eve and she was with child. Adam and Eve had sex and she was with child. But all ten of those times when it refers to sex, it's always heterosexual sex. So none of the 943 times is it ever used to refer to gay sex. Okay? And so, it says they bring them out that we may know them. Um, Lot said no. And he said, here, I have two virgin daughters. Take them and do whatever you want to do with them for the night. Now, two things. Number one, if there were a bunch of gay men out there wanting to rape the angels, you don't offer your daughters. You offer yourself, right? But he wasn't about to do that. But however, to me, the sin of Sodom is Lot offering his daughters to this crowd. And I've never heard a fundamentalist preacher preach against that. Right? And so Lot offered his daughters. They said no. And so they escaped from the city, uh, Lot and his friends, and the city was destroyed. So, you know, to me, there is almost no evidence, especially if, you, if, if it's properly translated, there's almost no evidence that Sodom and Gomorrah had, destruction had anything to do with homosexuality. And it's never even mentioned in the ancient writings. The ancient writing Ben Sirach said it was arrogance or pride. Why, was why Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed. The wisdom of Solomon links it back to hospitality. 
right? Um, and so in none of the ancient Jewish writings is it ever mentioned that they were destroyed because of homosexuality. It wasn't until Josephus was looking at um, why, why all of kinds of ancient disasters happened. And, and he looked at this passage and said, well, okay, why were Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed? And Philo and Josephus, two non-religious scholars, were the first ones to make the connection in the first century. It wasn't until the first century that ever in any writings, Jewish or not, was there ever anything mentioned about Sodom and homosexuality. It was when they first mentioned it and then it became almost accepted uh, following then. Now, even if they had been homosexuals and even if they wanted to get the, the Lot's guests to come out, that's rape. That's not homosexual love. And even if it was a bunch of gay men and they wanted to rape the angels, that should be condemned as rape and not as homosexual love. Next, um, Leviticus. Um, man shall not lie with mankind as with a woman. That is an abomination. Their blood shall be upon their heads. I've had to address this so many times I'm have it memorized and I was not a good Baptist I didn't memorize scripture easily um, and if you look at this section it's Leviticus it's the holiness code it's the code that was to tell the people of Israel how to organize worship in the temple how to clean things in the temple how to set themselves apart even the word Leviticus Levi it's the code for priests Levi and so it's the priestly code of how to set the people of Israel apart and to be different. And in this section, um, there is a, a variety of things condemned. And the word uh, it, for abomination is used. It's, it's an abomination. It's the same word for idolatry. Right? And so sometimes you see the same word translated abomination in some places in the Old Testament, and other, other words, the same word is translated as idolatrous. And what the belief was, you know, the ancient prayer, thank you God that I wasn't created a Gentile, that I wasn't created a woman. Right? The belief was that men were created in the image of God, and women were made from men, that women were less than men. And if you put a man in a woman's position, that's idolatrous. Right? And so, man shall not lie with mankind as a woman. That is idolatrous. So what they're saying is, if a man has sex with a man like he would with a woman, that's idolatrous because women were not created in the image of God. But men were. And so, you know, it's based in misogyny. It's based in a, in a, in a belief that, uh, that women were less than. And this was so ingrained in the culture that other tribes, when they invaded Jewish communities, would forcibly sodomize the men to humiliate them, to rape them, because they knew how much it was idolatrous for Jewish people that a man would be treated like a woman. Um, and... If you take also a look at this book of Leviticus, women wearing red, cross-breeding cattle, cross-fertilizing fields condemned, adultery condemned, delinquent children stoned to death, it says that every seven years, debts are to be forgiven. And I've never seen a Christian businessmen's fellowship talk about forgiving debts every seven years. It says, I mentioned about deformity, it says you're not to eat raw meat. I'm a vegetarian, that makes sense to me. Um, shellfish, rabbit. You're not to harvest all of the food in a field. You're supposed to leave around the edge of the field some food for people who are poor to be able to get food. You're supposed to pay your workers daily. Not weekly or every second week, but daily. It supports slavery in the book of Levit Leviticus. And so when, in the New Testament times, when they're having this argument about circumcision, because in the Old Testament it says all adult men have to, all, all males should be circumcised. And when the New, New Testament church was being formed, they had this big fight about, did you have to become Jewish before you became Christian? 
What it really was a fight about is do you have to become circumcised before you became a Christian? And for most non-Jewish males, that was a problem. It was not exactly popular. Right? And it was a barrier. So Peter and Paul had an argument. Peter was conservative. He said they have to be circumcised first. Paul was not. And he said, no, we should welcome everyone. And Paul said, we are free from the law. And he said to Peter, if you keep one part of the law, you have to keep it all. It's all or nothing. So I say to the Christian church who wants to use Leviticus to condemn gay and lesbian people, then you better start forgiving debts every seven years. You better take out the wheelchair ramps. You better, you know, do all of the other things in this. It's all or nothing, Paul said. And he said, we're free from the law. Okay, next, moving into the New Testament. Now, um, the New Testament, I'm going to do 1 Corinthians and 1 Timothy uh, together. And in this section, Paul lists categories of people that will not inherit the kingdom of God, will not inherit the realm of God. And he lists, there's lists. And in those lists are two words, catamites and arsenokoites. And catamites literally means soft as in clothing, people who are morally weak. But the King James translates it the effeminate, thinking that women were morally weak, and so therefore, if men were morally weak and effeminate, they were condemned. And other translations talk about this as moral weakness, not as effeminate. Now, the problem is when most people think of the word effeminate, they think of gay men. And the second word that p- comes right with it is um, a word that's used to condemn temple prostitution. And the active person in the temple prostitution. And so when these two words come together, morally wor- weak, and someone who's uh, using temple prostitutes, then it gets confusing what the meaning is. And the patriarch of Constantinople in the 16th century used these words to refer to homosexual and heterosexual temple prostitution in a letter that he wrote. Again, prostitution. Um, Robin Scrogg says, we cannot know for certain today what those two words mean how they should be translated. Now, if you take a look at the Parallel Bible and take a look at how these are translated, the King James says this, neither the effeminate nor the abusers of themselves with mankind. The Phillips Modern says, neither the effeminate nor the pervert. The Revised Standard says, neither the immoral nor the sexual perverts. The today's English version combines the two words together and says, nor homosexual perverts. The New International says, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders. Not homosexuals, homosexual offenders. Right? And the Jerusalem Bible says, catabites or sodomites. And the New English Bible says, homosexual perversion. So, scholars today said, people are guessing to try to figure out what these two words mean. And how these, what these two words mean when they're put together. And um, I have a note somewhere um, that talks about, um, uh, there was a Bible professor from Vancouver who was asked to do the commentary on Corinthians for the Presbyterian Church in the United States when they were doing a full biblical commentary. And he was, was doing it on 1 Corinthians, and he said as well, he said, we cannot clearly uh, know what was meant by these two words in the list. And he said, and it would be wrong for us to condemn a whole group of society when we don't know what the words mean. So, Romans... Romans 1, 26 and 27, and uh, now, those of you who are lesbians, 
up until now, you can say it's all about gay men. They're the problem. Okay? And so here's the first time. So wake up. If you're a lesbian, wake up. <laughs> Romans 1. For this cause, God gave them over to vile affections. Now, if you read the, the previous part of this chapter, it talks about people giving up worshiping God and doing idolatrous things, worshiping trees and animals and all kinds of stuff and doing all kinds of adult, uh, idolatrous things. For this cause, God gave them up to vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one towards another, men with men working that which is unseemly and receiving in, in themselves their own recompense or their own uh, punishment. Now, this is probably the scripture that causes the most difficulty of all of the eight uh, sections of scripture because it seems to be, it's New Testament and, and the, the Timothy one is, is similar. Um, and it, it seems to be more uh, clear. Um, I'm sorry, I, no, that's right, I'm, right, I'm where I'm supposed to be. Um, and if you look at the phrase against nature and how that's, that phrase is used in Greek and Roman times, it always refers to pedophilia. The phrase against nature always refers to pedophilia, yet never refers to adult loving homosexual relationships. And if you look at the Greek word, the Greek word is the, is the word for shame, which is typically used as a judgment against pedophilia, not against homosexuality. And so Scroggs and others would say that what, what this, it's either condemning pedophilia or it's making the assumption that everyone is heterosexual and does homosexual things because it says who burned in their lust one towards another, who because of lust got involved in homosexual behavior. Um, and so some people would say they're, they're condemning situational homosexuality. For instance, like people who go in prison, who are perfectly happily, happy heterosexuals, <laughs> go to prison, and while in prison have sexual relationships with other men in prison because they don't have a choice and they need to express themselves sexually and then when they leave prison they go right back to their wives or their girlfriends again. But who because of lust changed their behavior and did that which is against nature. So I would say what that scripture is saying to me as a very committed heterosexual, uh, homosexual that it's saying to me that I should not have sex with a woman if I'm burning for lust and leaving what is natural for me to do what is unnatural. In the same way it's saying to a heterosexual person, now lust and love are two different things in the Bible, right? Lust in the Bible is sexual attraction gone wild. So when you walk down Church Street and you see some hot people, you know, and you're really attracted, you say, oh, that person's really, really hot, you know, or Sunday in church when the pastor comes up to preach the sermon and you say, wow, isn't he cute, right? <laughs> That's not lust. That's wisdom. You know, that's, that's just you know, a good eye, you know. That's attraction. And it's perfectly okay to have sexual attraction. But when you do things like say, okay, I'm going to try and get that person drunk and take advantage of them. Right? Or I'm going to get them high on some drugs and take advantage of them. Or I'm going to manipulate them into a situation. Or when you become obsessed with it. That's when it moves from love or just basic sexual attraction into lust. Right? And so that verse is saying when people did what was unnatural for them because of lust, that's what's condemned. And, and I would argue, and scholars would argue, that that is, has nothing to do with adult loving homosexual relationships. You know, attraction isn't lust. Right? It's when it gets out of control. And so finally, the last scripture, uh, the first seven have to do with mistranslation, have to do with rape, have to do with pedophilia, uh, have to do with lust, and not adult-loving homosexuals. And I remember one time I was debating a Baptist minister, and this is absolutely true. I wish I could save the clip. It was on TV. And I was debating a Baptist minister, and he started off with the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, and then he went to Leviticus and, and, and stuff, and, and, and stuff. And he, said, and he finally said, oh, 
he said, you know, it's Adam and Eve, it's not Adam and Steve. And, and it says, you know, arsenokati is, is, is condemned. And it, it's obviously about homosexual because it's got arse in it. You know, like just crazy stuff. So, you know, when they get frustrated, they often come back to the story of Adam and Eve. And they'll say, God didn't create Adam and Steve. God created Adam and Eve. And my first comment is, then who created Adam and Steve? Where did Adam and Steve come from? You know, the Bible verse says that God created Adam and Eve and go out and said, and multiply and fill the earth. That's probably the only Bible verse the humanity has ever taken seriously. Go forth and multiply and fill the earth. We've done it. Right? Check. <laughs> right? Now let's pay attention to all the other things that, that God wants us to do. Um, and there are two creation stories in, 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 in any of the Bibles. Two creation stories. One stresses procreation, and the other stresses companionship. Okay? And I think both are important. Um, and that sex is more than just for procreation. And sex is also as a, you know, I think that, that when people say that sex is only for procreation, I say, what about elderly heterosexual couples? Or what about heterosexual couples where, where it's impossible to produce children? Are you saying they can't have sex? Right? Sex isn't just about procreation. Or what about gay and lesbian? What about lesbians who want to procreate through artificial insemination? So lesbianism is okay? And sex is okay because it... Yeah. Um, so, I want to move on now to talk about new words of encouragement because the Bible just isn't about de defending these things that are attacking us. Um, and the first thing I find encouraging is looking at these scriptures. Right? And looking how biblical scholars, there's a wonderful, wonderful story. Um, our denomination decided to apply for membership in the National Council of Churches in the United States, way, way, way back. And we went before the constituent committee, which was eight members of the National Council of Churches, and they reviewed our denomination, our statement of faith, et cetera, and they said, there is no reason why you cannot be accepted into the National Council of Churches, you meet all the requirements. But then the Orthodox denominations and the historic black denominations all said they would leave the National Council of Churches if it even came up for a vote in the whole council. So the head of the National Council of Churches came to us and said, I, I can't bring your application to a vote. It'll split the National Council of Churches. So why don't you just be off to the side, work with us, and we'll see what happens in a few years. Right? And so we did that. We were on a couple of committees, worked together with them, et cetera. Went back to them again. Oh, not ready yet. Not time yet. Not time yet. Not time yet. And so eventually our denomination went and said, look, why don't we have a national debate on the issue of homosexuality in the Bible? If this is really what the issue is, why don't we have a national? You bring some scholars together. We'll bring some scholars together. And we'll have a national debate. And they said, okay. We didn't hear anything. And a few weeks later, we got a phone call. And they said, can you give us the name of some of the scholars who say the Bible condemns homosexuality? Because everybody that we approach says they don't believe the Bible condemns homosexuality. Or they're not, they don't believe there's strong evidence to condemn it from the Bible. So we need some of the people that you're debating to, to debate. Can you tell us who they are? Right? Uh, and we did. And there never was a debate. The majority of biblical scholars today say that the evidence in those scriptures that I've mentioned to you is so questionable that it's immoral to condemn a whole section of society based on poor scholarship. And more and more scholars are saying that. So I find that encouraging to see that shift. Then there's the story of, Sodom, of, sorry, of Jonathan and David, and I've gone through that story to explain to you um, about how they met on the field and, and, and got together. But I want to tell you the final story, the final piece in the story of Jonathan and David. Eventually, there was a war, and Jonathan was killed in the battle. And they sent the message to David. And David tore his clothes and mourned and mourned, and he said, Jonathan... Your love for me was wonderful, passing the love of a woman. 
I think David probably was bisexual. He went on to, you know, do all kinds of things. Um, and he was probably bisexual. I think that he and Jonathan were in love. And he recognized that Jonathan's love for him. And this is never condemned in Scripture. Similarly, there's the story of Ruth and Naomi. Now, that's not as clear. Um, Naomi was um, an older woman. She had two sons. Those sons got married. The sons died. And Naomi decided that after her husband died and her sons died, that she was going to go back to her home country, to go back to her relatives. And she said to her two daughter-in-laws, you can stay here with your people. I'm going to go back to my people. And Ruth said, no. Where you go, I will go. Where you lie, I will die. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. May God never separate us. Those words are officially accepted in the Roman Catholic liturgy to be read in weddings for heterosexual people. And their words, two women said to each other. So eventually, Ruth went with Naomi and remarried, and Naomi became the nanny, you know, for the kids. So they had this household. Now, whether they ever had sex, we don't know. There's no evidence, we don't know. But clearly, this is a love story between two women. So much so that the Catholic Church even includes it in their liturgy for weddings. And when my sister got married in the Catholic Church, she asked me to read the scripture, and I said, can I choose it? <laughs> and she said, yes. And so I chose. Ruth speaking to Naomi. Next is Ecclesiastes 4, 9 to 12. And in the New English Bible, um, this scripture t- talks about for everything there is a time under heaven. And, but it also talks about, it says, it's better for two men to lie with each other than to be alone. It's better for two men to lie with each other because if one falls down, the other can pick him up. And to lie with each other means to have sex. Right? That's in the book of Ecclesiastes. Matthew chapter 19, verses 3 to 12, about marriage. They were pushing everybody to get married. And Jesus said, it's better for people to be married. But he said, but if it's not meant for you, don't get married. He's talking about heterosexual marriage in his day. It's better for people to be married. But if it's not meant for you, then don't do it. And Jesus also talked about eunuchs. And, you know, when you think of eunuchs, if you've watched enough television, you know eunuchs were thought of as castrated males, right? And, but also in ancient times, eunuchs were thought of as sexual minorities who couldn't have children or didn't have children. And in ancient times, homosexuals were thought of as eunuchs, right? And Jesus said, there are eunuchs that are made that way by birth. There are eunuchs that are... Uh, are uh, who choose to be eunuchs, and there are eunuchs who are made that way by people, i.e. castrated. And Jesus said, eunuchs were once not a part of the people of God, and they're now welcomed into the people of God. So some scholars would say, Jesus was saying that gay people who were once not part of the church are now welcomed into the church. In his mind, in the mind, people knew what he was saying, that when he was talking about eunuchs, he wasn't just talking about castrated males. In Matthew chapter 25, um, the, they were debating, we've got all these rules and regulations, what's the most important? And Jesus said to love God and to love your neighbor as you love yourself. And I would ask anyone, how does my being in a loving relationship with John Timothy Sproul for 36 years interfere with my love of God or my love of neighbor or the love of myself? Romans 8.1, there is now no condemnation, I said that earlier. Romans 12.9, I think to me this is the most powerful verse. Let love be without hypocrisy. So if you're saying to me as a gay man to let my love be without hypocrisy, that is from saying to me that I'm a gay man. So from not my love to be honest is to love another gay man. Proverbs 27.5, 
Better is open rebuke than hidden love. Better is open rebuke than hidden love. Come out, come out wherever you are. John 17, 17, 17, be made holy in the truth. Living the truth helps you to experience holiness more than living a lie. 1 Corinthians 7, 17 to 20 and 24, um, we talked about it earlier about circumcision. Uh, I don't have the reference, I keep forgetting to write this reference down, uh, but there's a New, script, New, New Testament reference where Jesus said, don't call anyone a fool. And I heard a lecture once by a Roman Catholic Jesuit scholar who said that when you look up the root of that fool, the best translation is, don't call anyone a faggot. It's a derogatory term used against gay people, and Jesus is saying, don't do that. And it was translated as fool uh, into English, mistranslated. Um, so, in summary, before we get into all questions and comments and discussion and debate, um, sometimes when I do this, um, people get really angry. Get really angry about how could the church have done to gay and lesbian people what it did based on such, such shoddy scholarship. And my answer to that is, Jesus may be the head of the church, but it's a human institution. And the church has made some awful mistakes in, in a number of different areas. But so has every other institution in society. The legal profession, the educational profession, the medical profession. You can look at the history of all of those institutions and their negative attitude and what they've done to gay and lesbian people down through the centuries. So don't just pick on the church alone. Most human institutions have not understood gay and lesbian people, bisexual or transgender people, or homosexuality. I wish the church could be better. I think the church is becoming better. Uh, I think this church has led the way in terms of uh, the expansion and, and the acceptance of gay and lesbian people and our human rights and transgender people. For some people, they hear this and they're excited. It gives them hope for themselves and for the future. I hope that what it leaves most of us with is a spirit of reconciliation. You know, that we can get to the place of, of reconciling our spirituality and our sexuality and not having to choose one over the other, but bring them together. I hope it gets us to the place of being able to accept and to, to reconcile our gayness or our being lesbian or transgender or bisexual and our spirituality. But I hope it also leads some recon to some reconciliation with the Christian church. The Christian church needs us. <coughs> It needs our voice. It needs our challenge uh, to, to grow and to change. Um, in Isaiah it says, Yet others I have to gather to them, to those already gathered. I think that's saying to us that part of our role, whether we're gay or straight, bi, transgender, gay or straight, lesbian, whatever, that part of our role is to reach out to people who've been left out. You know, and well, this has all been about homosexuality, basically. There are lots of people left out for all kinds of reasons. You know, when I grew up in my Baptist church, my Baptist minister's daughter got pregnant. And she had to leave the church. Uh, one of the first straight women to come to our church was the wife of a Baptist minister. And when she came out, they kicked him out of the church. And when they divorced, she went to the church where she knew that she wasn't going to be blamed and condemned. Right? Uh, there are people who have given up on the church because they're divorced. Right? When people were dying of AIDS, they came here to die because they would be accepted. But many of their families came here too because they knew that their church wouldn't accept them. The church would somehow blame them. There are people who don't believe certain things that feel they have no place. There are lots and lots of folks for lots and lots of reasons who feel left out. And I think that one of the wonderful things about MCC, we mean it. 
when we say welcome home. You don't have to leave your sexuality or your intellect or your differences or your mistakes or anything behind. Welcome home. And I think because some of us have been left out for some reasons or kicked out for some reasons, the number one value in the gay and lesbian community, when I chaired the community advisory um, panel for Pride Toronto, and we did a survey, and thousands of people filled out the survey, and the number one value in the GLBT community is inclusion because of what we've experienced. And I think as a church, as a faith community, if we can practice that um, inclusion, vibrant, inclusive, and progressive, then I think that's what we're called uh, to do and to be. So we've got time for about two, couple of questions, and then at 10 to, I'm gonna hand it over to the, the leader. To, so some questions and comments and disagreements and thoughts. Um, it's a lot, I know, and you've been very patient. You'll never complain about sitting through a 17-minute sermon again, will you, after sitting through all this? Anybody have any questions or thoughts? or Anything you want to say? No, it's okay. So, yep. Yep. Yeah. 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 Irshid Manji is, is a brilliant young Muslim scholar and prophet. And uh, she, uh, when she talks about her faith and how the, there have been huge periods where Islam has been a huge progressive, modern, accepting faith, coexisting with people of other faiths and together. The problem is that there have been periods in the Christian church where the fundamentalist wing of the church took over. And it was not pretty for lots of people. And, and right now we're going through a period for, for Muslims where the fundamentalist wing of the Muslim faith seems to be getting all the airtime, right? And um, oh, I'm trying to remember his name. God's Politics, written by... Jim Wallace. Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you, Dolly, Jim Wallace. And in God's Politics, he says that the only way to counteract bad religion is with good religion. And by bad religion, he means fundamentalism. Right? So, and he says, whenever bad religion meets secularism, bad religion will always win, because people will want to have something to believe in. And he uses Turkey as the example, not because of the Muslim issue, but because Turkey was once a proudly secular state, right? Very secular in its constitution. And the fundamentalist wing of Islam grew and grew and grew. And so they weren't provided with a moderate wing. And eventually, the fundamentalist wing has taken over Turkey. And now there's this big struggle about whether Turkey is going to remain a secular state or not. And he uses that as an example that we need to be supporting moderate and progressive Muslim communities to be the alternative to fundamentalism. Right? And I'm nervous about North America because the moderate and progressive wing of the Christian church in North America is declining. And they say that in a few years, the only face of Christianity that people see publicly in North America will be the fundamentalist wing. And that people then will reject that. Right? But I think there are a lot of parallels between the Muslim community and the Muslim scriptures and the Muslim traditions and what's happening in Christianity. And in a lot of the cases, we've not, uh, we've not taken into account the impact of culture on the church and the church accepting, or the Muslim faith, accepting cultural biases and prejudices. Uh, instead of being the institution that challenges them, we've assumed them. Sorry? I'm assuming that it hasn't broken you because you're standing here. And, and for the people who are sitting here, I'm assuming that they sometimes a struggle not to be broken yep. by abuse of power. 
Yeah. I think it's, I think it's unbelievable. You know, it traditionally, gay and lesbian people, I'm not sure transgender, I'm not sure how that fits in into the two-spirited terminology. Um, maybe someone can help me figure that out. But I know that traditionally, gay and lesbian people were in many different cultures were thought of as the wise ones, the holy ones, the shamans. And my guess is probably transgender people would fit that better than gay and lesbian people in terms of the two-spirited nature. Um, and that, um, that when you see what the traditional Christian church has done, for many people it has shaken them. They feel like they've had to choose their sexuality over their spirituality. Right? And I think that one of the jobs of MCC has been to, I don't want to say re-spiritualize the GLBT community, but I think to make spirituality and religion acceptable again. Right? And I think the fact that this church was chosen as the honored group a few years ago by Pride Toronto for the Pride Parade without us even lobbying for it. We didn't pack the room for the vote. We didn't lobby. Someone nominated us and we were chosen. It's an amazing testament of how far we've come from a day when I was spit on by a leader in the, in the gay community who's still around when I went to my first gay conference because I wore a collar and he spit on me because he said I was selling out to the enemy religion. Right? And then we get from there to the case where the church is being honored. Right? And, and I just think that, you know, I, you know, I'm, when I look around and see nature and see miracles all over the place, I see God. You know, there's something behind all this. It's not just chance. And, you know, when I look at Jesus, I see in Jesus the best example I've been able to find of someone who's lived the principles. You know, right? And so... You know, that's, that's the call on my life. And, and I think that the church has a lot, the church at its best has a lot to offer. And I think MCC Toronto, you know, can be that example and is that example. And, um, you know, that's why I've been here for 40 years. You know, I believe in what we're doing and I believe, you know, in the lives we're touching. And, you know, every single Sunday, someone walks in that door and sits down and cries and cries and cries. And that's healing. Right? They feel home, they feel accepted, you know. So, thank you for your patience. This has been a long, long night. Um, thank you to the, the folks on, on Facebook out there watching us and hanging in with us. Thank you for being there. Pass it on, pass it on, pass it on to others. Uh, our website is mcctoronto.com. And there you can, we also live stream, uh, and you can see the last few weeks of our, our worship services, the music, the sermons, everything are there. Uh, let us know that you're out there, you know, send us some information, uh, connect with us. Uh, again, thank you also uh, for being a part of this evening. And Mike, it's all yours.